Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. HB 1948 uh, is similar but not identical to a bill I brought up in special session. I call it the Good Apples Bill. And it's a bill that's designed to uh, basically have the police police the police and have uh, law enforcement police law enforcement. It's designed to prevent the bad apples from um, committing misconduct. And so the bill has three parts. The first part is the duty to render aid. If someone is facing a life-threatening situation, uh, then if circumstances permit, a law enforcement officer on duty is required to administer aid. I'm confident that the vast majority would do so anyway. This makes it a matter of policy. It will be taught in training, and it's critical that, that folks know that they are required to render aid a life threat when someone's life is threatened and circumstances permit. The second part of the bill is probably more the heart of the bill. Uh, this is the, the duty to report wrongdoing. So if a law enforcement officer sees another officer committing wrongdoing, and wrongdoing is defined in the bill as a violation which is not of a merely technical or minimal nature, can't be technical or minimal, but it's a violation of a federal law, a state law, a regulation, local ordinance, or a rule of an officer's law enforcement agency designed to protect the interests of the public, and it includes bias-based profiling. So if a law enforcement officer witnesses another law enforcement officer committing wrongdoing, as so defined, that law enforcement officer is required to report it up the line. They would report it to the supervisor. The report could be anonymous, but the report is required or the witness faces disciplinary action, which includes a wide range of things from dismissal, demotion, suspension, or transfer. Uh, this bill is designed to make sure that officers are not committing misconduct. Sometimes the chief of police or the sheriff may not realize that a certain officer is a problem officer who is committing all kinds of problems. And folks down the line know, but the folks at the top don't necessarily know. This is designed to encourage folks to police themselves. Uh, the punishment is relatively minimal, but it is important to make sure that we stop these things before they become far more severe. It also, in the bill, is a duty of all law enforcement officers to cooperate fully with persons lawfully assigned to conduct investigations. If you're not going to cooperate with an investigation, then again, you face discipline. The other thing the bill does, which is quite important, is it expands the definition of bias-based profiling. We added bias-based profiling to the code last year uh, based on perceived race, real or perceived race, ethnicity, age, and gender. This adds sexual orientation and gender identity or any combination thereof, quite important because sometimes the intersection of race and particularly gender identity, uh, we know that, that, for example, black transgender folks tend to be the most profiled and we want to make sure they are added to the code as prohibited racial bias, prohibited uh, bias-based profiling. So that's the heart of the bill. We have a number of witnesses that are here to testify. I'm happy to take questions about it. Uh, or we can move right to our report. And before we get there, are there any questions from the chair? I mean, from the committee? I do have some witnesses, Madam Chair, that I think would like to testify about this bill. Sure. And um, we'll go with the, uh, the clerk, if you could call those witnesses. Have, Mr. Chair, um, <laughs> have you com communicated uh, which ones or do you need to name them? Yes, why, why, don't, why don't I name, um, okay. th th we'll just go, there's five witnesses, there's four witnesses, excuse me. I don't know if they're all here, but let's start with Ms. Valerie Slater. Let's call Ms. Valerie Slater in the room, please. Ms. Slater, are you with us? Okay, well, can we go to number two? We'll, we'll come back for Ms. Slater. All right, uh, V. Lamnick, are you available? Is V. Lamnick available? Good morning. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, there she is. There, there they Let's are. Let's go forward. 
Wonderful. Wonderful. Good, Good morning, morning to the chair, chair and the members of the committee. My name is V. Lamnick. I'm the Executive Director of Equality Virginia. We are the leading advocacy organization seeking equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Virginians, and I'm here to speak in support of Delegate Levine's HB 1948. Um, due to societal norms and expectations around sexual orientation and gender identity, we know that LGBTQ individuals experience an increased rate um, of harassment and violence from law enforcement officers. LGBT people, especially Black, Latinx, Indigenous LGBT people, are more likely to be victimized by discriminatory police practices. In addition, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people who are identifying as LGBT and are living with HIV are two and a half times likely to experience police brutality, including when they are seeking aid from law enforcement. Um, as, as the delegate mentioned, we also know that transgender women, women are six times more likely to endure police violence, and black transgender women experience even higher rates of being antagonized and criminalized by police. Many, Many black, black transgender women, women are confronted by law enforcement for simply, quote, walking while trans. The police practice this that's rooted in racism and bias assumptions that the individual is using drugs or engaging in sex work. So HB 1948 would broaden the definition of bias-based bias profiling to include sexual orientation and gender identity and therefore would effectively ban discriminatory policing against LGBT Virginians. This would ensure that police in these, uh, that engage in these harmful practices face consequences and it provides the LGBT community in Virginia with increased protection from police, police harassment and abuse. Thank you for your support of this bill. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have just a, a technical thing. Could, could, could we ask everyone to go on? I'm hearing from the audience that there's a lot of feedback. Could I ask everyone, if you're not speaking, and that includes the clerk and, and the patron, if you're not speaking, please go on mute because the public is having a hard time hearing speakers. Thanks. Thank you for that. And uh, Delegate Levine, if you want to go to your next witness. Um, the next witness we have is uh, Ms. Amanda Silcox. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. okay. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, Chair members, members of the subcommittee. subcommittee. My, name My name is Amanda Socox, and I serve as the legislative coordinator for Rise for Youth. For Youth. Uh, we, are uh, we are testifying today in support of Delegate Levine's bill, bill, House Bill 1948. Um, we, we believe this would have many outcomes for, for, for folks across Virginia. Virginia. We, want we want officers to know that any wrongdoing must be reported and is subject to disciplinary action. Um, further, further note, furthermore, furthermore, as we mentioned, we know that black trans women are harassed, targeted, and murdered at horrifying rates, um, and we believe including sexual orientation and gender identity in the definition of bias-based policing would be an important step to protect them as well as others who face this type of discrimination. We believe this bill complements the police reforms that you all passed this summer, and thank you for your time. Thank you, and I do believe, um, Delegate Levine, we just saw Valerie Slater. I think she's available. Good morning. Good morning. My, name My name is Valerie Slater, Slater and I, I am here, here to represent Rise for Youth and the Activated People. people. And, and we, we are, are in support of this bill because, because it makes it a duty for officers to report the bad acting of, of other officers. officers. It, it also, it creates the duty for officers to render aid to injured individuals. And it, it adds to the definition of bias-based profiling. Uh, it makes it include sexual orientation and gender identity. All of these things are incredibly important because there is nothing that is detracted from policing. Everything is a positive addition to what we already expect of officers. And so for those reasons, we are in support of this bill, both the activated people and rights for youth. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Delegate Levine, did you have one more? I am muted now. I believe Dominique Martin from the New Virginia Majority. Okay. Welcome, Dominique. 
Good morning. Good morning. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Madam, Madam Chair, Chair and members of the subcommittee. Um, my, name my name is Dominic Martin, Martin policy research analyst at New Virginia Majority. And I'd uh, first, first like to echo the sentiments um, already expressed, expressed by previous speakers and the patron. And I would just like to add that one of the major themes when discussing long lasting approaches to police reform is the need for change at the institutional level. And we believe this bill does that. Uh, uh, one aspect is addressing organizational culture, uh, uh, which is what this bill is uh, targeting. It incentivizes a more accountable culture amongst law enforcement, and all officers are incentivized to ensure that the department as a whole is operating at the highest professional standards at all times so that institutional issues do not manifest and become part of the norm within that particular agency's culture. Um, so it also establishes a mechanism to keep officers accountable to each other, which is a uh, a large, a large thing, thing as well, well. and so, so these, these reasons, reasons and like i said the one expressed previously with other speakers are of the many reasons we support the bill thank you, thank you very much thank you and mr clark do we have anyone in the room for public testimony Uh, Delegate Levine, did you have anyone uh, on your speaker's queue? Madam Chair, or? that exhausts the speaker's queue. Okay, awesome. And are there any uh, questions or any uh, statements that need to be made for, uh, by the committee? I have, I have a question, um, Madam Chairman. Yes, Delegate Roxanne, I mean, Robinson. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Uh, so I just have a question on uh, just the language that's in line 16 and 17. And I don't even know who to direct this language, this question to. It might be counsel. Can somebody tell me what as circumstances objectively permit means? So, um, Delegate, uh, Madam Chair, respond. Um, yes, go for it. Uh, Delegate Robinson, um, this was put in. So this is the duty to um, to render aid to, to someone suffering from a serious bodily injury or life-threatening condition. And it, it was thought that while that would certainly be something that a law enforcement officer on duty would want to do the vast majority of the time, there would be cases as circumstances objectively permit that would not do that. An example would be to save someone else's life. Uh, if uh, you have someone who's injured, perhaps, but has a gun and, uh, you know, is dangerous. Uh, one can imagine what happened in the Capitol where someone is injured, but still, but still dangerous. So the, the, the idea is that it should be done normally, but as the circumstances objectively permit, there are cases where a, a reasonable law enforcement officer would not render aid. I don't think there are many. Uh, but I think where there's another life-threatening condition, um, if there's five people that are bleeding and you can only save one at a time, that would be another example. Um, the, the goal was to give a, a small but reasonable out where um, circumstances, maybe the officer can't get to a person who is dying. They, they physically can't get there or the officer is injured himself or herself and uh, can't render aid. Uh, the, the idea is that it, it gives a relatively small exception out as uh, circumstances objectively permit um, th so that to explain reasonably why an officer is not rendering aid. Thank you, Delegate Levine and, and Madam Chairman. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yes. Delegate Will, you can ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I don't have a question. I, I want to speak to the bill at appropriate time. I'm sorry. This is the appropriate time. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, I get the overall intent of the legislation. Um, you know, big picture, I don't think that law enforcement should be discriminating against anyone for any reason. So with that, you know, I'm, I'm on board. But the part that concerns me is... The, the, the way the bill's written, you know, we, we just, uh, Delia Robinson just asked about the, the whole idea of objectivity. And to me, I mean, this, this, the way it's written, it lends itself to anything but objectivity. I mean, it, it everything here is so subjective um, it, on, on so many fronts. And so, you know, with that, I mean, I have, I have concerns about how it, how it would be applied, who's, Who's going to determine how the the call being made at, at the in the heat of the moment, if you will? Uh, I just it's just so um, 
but just open for I mean, at the very least lawsuits and and you know who's gonna who's gonna make the who's gonna make the call and, and my fear is as law enforcement looks at this and and what's being uh, potentially required of them they you know you, you got the part in there about rendering aid I thought that was already a part of their duty but forgive me I, you know maybe it's not but go you know anything else. You know, my fear is the potential for law enforcement to just back away and say, hey, I'm not going to do anything because this thing's, I'm, is the old saying, I'm damned if I do and damned if I don't. And so, I, you know, it just, there's just a lot of holes in it. And for that reason, I'm, I'm going to be voting against the legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank, thank you. I see uh, the Uber Chair's hands up. Uh, Delegate Hope. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to speak to what Delegate Will uh just just said and and you know he he raised some concerns and uh and i appreciate his his perspective on it uh I, i'm more interested though however it's real applicability is for law enforcement uh, my question is for delegate levine any of the concerns that delegate Wilt raised has that come from law enforcement I, have you heard from the sheriff's association or chiefs of police in opposition to this bill or raising delegate Wilt's concerns Thank you for that question, Delegate Hope. Uh, no, I have not. Uh, I can tell you that the Chief of Police of Alexandria um, this uh, supports this bill. And in fact, most of this bill is already in the requirements of the Chief of Police of Alexandria. Also, Chief of Police of Norfolk strongly supports this bill. I think Delegate Wilt is right. He thought this was already a requirement. Well, I think most police, most deputies, most sheriffs, believe they are required it's not in the code but most or many i should say already contracts between law enforcement and the folks working there require them to render aid require them to report wrongdoing it's not consistent across the commonwealth and part of the reason for this bill frankly is for training so that we can, they can say it is the law so that police officers uh, sheriff's deputies know they are required to report wrongdoing which the chief of police and the sheriffs generally support. Um, I, I have not heard, um, uh, I, there may be individuals who oppose this, they're, they're not here in this room right now, uh, but I can tell you that um, generally supervisors wanna know, and to answer Delegate Wilt's concern about who enforces this, largely it's enforced by supervisors. If you look at section B, and this is line number uh, 28, the duty is simply to report it to your supervisor. This is not done by a court. This is not done by a judge. What the police officer has to do or the sheriff's deputy has to say is, look, I was there when, uh, you know, Officer Smith um, talked about racial profiling or um, was drunk on the job or was committing some kind of wrongdoing. I just want to let you know, supervisor, so you know about it. The supervisor then can act accordingly. And uh, of course, they're not required to report things that are minimal, but um, the supervisor then has a wide range of responsibility. They could put a letter in all the way up to firing the officer. So this is just a way of keeping officers accountable one to the other. It is designed to change the culture. Uh, I recognize that it's going to require folks to just do the right thing. And that's in essence what I think good apples, good cops already do. I would agree that good police officers, good sheriff's deputies, already do this but this way if it's in the code it's a way to show the good police officers this is the standard and it's the standard throughout the commonwealth it's not just in selective police departments uh so that folks know what the right thing is and frankly in their training and in their practice they'll say hey this is the law you must report such a thing and the real goal frankly is to stop police misconduct before it happens before it rises to the level of some of the atrocities frankly we've seen all across the country to change the culture so that folks know hey you can't do misconduct because my my friend on the force is going to have to report me or they face discipline so that's the goal of the legislation it's I, it's interesting it's both modest and large it's modest in that it really is seeking to codify what i think already should be police culture and is the requirements in many jurisdictions throughout virginia but it's large because it really tries to make it clear there is no thin blue line that the goal of law enforcement is to serve the public first. Um, and you shouldn't be covering up bad acts, severe acts, wrongdoing that's not technical or minimal by your fellow officer. So I hope that answers Delegate Wilt's concerns and I'm happy to answer any more questions. And are there any um, further questions seeing no uh, hands raised in the chat? 
Well, uh, just as a chair's prerogative, I would like to add uh, Newport News to that list uh, at a press conference after the um, uprisings this summer, the the chief said the same thing. It was just assumed that this sort of uh, policy was already written uh, or assumed that someone wouldn't have to be told this. Uh, but in the national news, we did see that the uh, the culture was such that it did needed to be stated explicitly. So uh, thank you, Delegate Levine. Uh, this committee operates on motion. Move to report. Second. So hearing a uh, move to report in a second, uh, the clerk will open the roll. And if the clerk could call the names not yet voted. Delegate Cole. Delegate Wilt. Nay. Delegate Wilt votes nay. And the clerk will close the roll. So that bill is reported on a vote of five to two. Uh, thank